Hello everybody, welcome to Talk About Houses. I'm Todd. I'm Lana. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, some predictions for what's going to happen in real estate in 2023. And this is from two people who are, uh, one is a analyst in the field and one is a um, CEO of a investment group. Okay. Okay. And they have sort of similar takes. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these and specifically, we're not going to really pay attention to whatever the numbers are, like how much they're going to go up or down or anything like that, but fundamentals. So this is a lesson in, um, you know, cause and effect. Okay. Something happens and then, you know, something over here happens and something over here happens. So that's, we're going to talk about those. These are economic forces. Okay. Okay. So, so before we get started, yes. um, if you are new to the channel, please subscribe, hit the notification bell and like the video. If you have been on the channel for a while, thank you for being here. Uh, like the video, share the video, and leave us comments. Go. And if you're a real estate agent, make sure you uh, sign up for Referral Cloud so you can get referrals in your market. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So the first one we're going to put up here, uh, this is David Yong. He's the CEO of Evergreen Group Holdings. He says the biggest opportunity in today's market is in business and real estate but it's limited to cash rich, rich investors. There's a possibility that the global economy is heading for a recession due to high interest rates. Wealthy investors have more opportunities to invest in assets at a bargain rate. So let's talk about this. There's this arbitrage thing with cash mm -hmm. and um, mortgage rates, right? Because people traditionally use loans when they think they can get more money in some other investment. They right. borrow at one rate and they invest at something that they think gets a higher rate. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that with stock or crypto because stocks are down substantially, right, mm -hmm. as an asset class. The S&P is down about 18%, the NASDAQ down 32% in the year. Ouch. If you borrowed money to go invest in stocks, you're getting, not only are you getting killed, but you also are having to pay interest on it, right? Right. Crypto is not a whole lot better, so it's been a rough year. <laughs> it's been a rough year. So how does that work? Like what is, what's the advantage of cash? We're not talking about making offers with cash, but economically, why, you know, if you're sitting on a bunch of cash, why is, he says business, and I think he means buying businesses, mm -hmm. but, and we'll talk about that too, because there is a, this is starting to happen, mm -hmm. but why real estate? Like why would cash buyers buy real estate right now? So look, um, real estate is, a tangible asset, right? Okay. It's, okay, a, it's so a tangible asset. It's a, it's a tangible asset. And, and people tend to want to put their money in tangible assets when there's economic uncertainty and when there is inflation. So now that's okay. that's the second part, right? Okay. So inflation. So we, we're, we're in an, an inflationary environment. And that means that uh, when you put your money in a hard asset like real estate, real estate is likely to, at the very least, uh, somewhat keep up with inflation, right? Mm -hmm. And so at the very least, you're protecting your cash that way. Maybe you're getting some rent, hopefully. Maybe you'll get some appreciation on top of that. So it makes sense to protect your cash that way. Maybe you're not going to make um, billions of dollars, but at the very least, you're protecting the value of your money. Okay. Uh, the next quote from the article, the greatest investment opportunities are in real estate and businesses, although they're limited cash rich investors. There's also an opportunity in venture capital or private equity. Um, now, he's talking about two separate things. Mm -hmm. He's talking about these companies that are um, uh, uh, venture capital firms, private equity, that are buying small startups. Okay. That's one thing they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're also talking about venture capital or private equity that's buying real estate because that's something that's new. Traditionally, venture capital was used to for um, to buy a business that was sort of starting to expand, mm -hmm. and then given enough money to you know really go to market big, hire a bunch of people, and grow into a biz big business, accelerate the growth of that business mm -hmm. to start pushing those potential revenue streams closer to the um, to now mm -hmm. to to make a higher profit, right? But we're also, we're seeing that because some of these SaaS companies and privately, publicly traded companies that are trading on really weird multiples, really low, these VC firms are starting to go back in and try to gobble them up. Mm -hmm. We're actually, it's like a reverse IPO. We're seeing these publicly traded companies 
you know, literally just being outright bought. Mm -hmm. Okay. But with real estate, this is interesting. It is, you know, it, it's a new environment and there just have been so many changes to the real estate environment over the last decade. And some of them have been slow. Some of them have been, um, pretty, pretty fast, but the whole, the whole, um, real estate market has changed in so many different ways. And this is a reflection of that. Okay. So the sort of the lesson here is if you have inflation, tangible assets are better. Mm -hmm. You could argue that we've, we had inflation in 2020 and 2021 and in 2022, and that's what caused real estate to go up. Like it was, it was, some of that was inflation. There were other factors, but that was a piece of it. Yeah. And that the reason they've gone down since the peak, it's almost exclusively because of interest rates. Like it just lopped off a ton of buyers. Right. It, it is almost exclusively because of interest rates, but it's not just interest rates. It's the psychology that goes along with it. I think that's what, I think that that's the piece that that's really underrated in, in this. Okay. So let's talk about psychology really quick. Is it sort of a, I don't want to buy now because it'll, the house will be cheaper in six months. I'll just wait it out. So this is an environment that is new to, um, to new buyers and is new to, um, a whole generation of buyers. Okay. Okay. And they're just not accustomed to this and they don't really know what to make of it. So they're, they're sitting it out. They're thinking, well, maybe prices will go down there's just too much uncertainty. A lot of things have changed and they've changed for um, this generation that is coming into its own, into the home buying market, okay. and they simply don't know what to make of all this. But there's a difference between somebody who buys a house to live in it, get a mortgage mm -hmm. the traditional way, and VCs or these big funds that are buying a bunch of houses. Right. So, that, that, But that's the whole point. Okay, that is exactly my point. So you've got the psychology of the individual purchaser, okay. which is what I was talking about. These people that simply don't have the um, the memory of real estate markets, other than what what's been uh, what's happened recently. And then you've got these institutional buyers that do have that memory, not necessarily firsthand, but th but they've looked at the track history of real estate and and they understand what uh, what value means in real estate. And they also have uh, a different interest rate than everybody else does. Mm. Uh, they, they've borrowed money maybe previously, went with a, at a much lower interest rate, even when they do go to market right now. So they're sitting on a bunch of cash that right. is very cheap to service. They're looking to place it somewhere. Well, and, so, and, and they have to place it because we just talked about inflation. If they don't place that cash, that, that cash will devalue. So it will its purchasing okay. power will be diminished. So okay. they do need to allocate that cash. It doesn't mean that they're going to buy junk, okay? Right. But it does mean that they are co continually looking for opportunities and for markets in which to deploy the, the cash so that it does not devalue in their hot little hands. Okay, so now here's the other take. Okay, that was one take. It, they didn't give any specifics. They just said they thought it was a, he thought it was a good investment. Okay, this one is Cheryl Palmer, CEO of Taylor Morrison. They are a new home builder. Mm -hmm. Told CNBC Squawk Box that the U.S. is in a housing recession, which sounds bad. She said rising interest rates and supply chain disruptions affect home buying and home building activity. So housing recession, the first thing you think of is that means... Um, Declining values. Declining values. Mm -hmm. but, but then, you ready for this? She goes on to say, Palmer expects the overall inventory volumes to drop next year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And could push home prices up moderately. Right. So, so we, why, let's talk about that lever. So this is a different lever. So she works in the new home building mm -hmm. thing. She sees, and we've talked about this, for probably 10 months in a row, new home builders have shrunk the amount exactly. of homes they're building. We're going to go into 2023 with probably the least number of new homes that we've seen in five or six years on the market. Yep. And you have all the homes in the resale market. A lot of those are locked up. They're not going anywhere. So you're hoping people come in and they're in, there have been deals for the last few months for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Home prices have dropped for sure. But they could, but home prices could go up because the way the lever works is when inventory goes down, you have more competing people competing for of scarcer resource, right? right? So long as people have jobs, 
okay. then we're not going to, it, it's unlikely that we will see substantial um, de devaluation in real estate, right? Right. Because so long as people have jobs, they're making their, their payments and, and so on. Uh, and so we're going to assume that, that the job market will remain relatively stable. Mm -hmm. So if we assume that, then we look at less inventory coming in from new home builders because they haven't been building, they haven't been pulling permits. So we know that they will build less homes in 2023 than they built in 2022. So we already know that. Right, right. So we're looking at less inventory from the new home section. And then as far as resale is concerned, we're looking at less inventory there because uh, we have such a substantial portion of the market that is owned by institutional uh, buyers and those homes will not be turning. Right. So that leaves a much smaller portion of the market that has the potential to turn. Okay. And in order for that for those for that housing stock to turn, they have to have homes to buy because they have to live somewhere. Right. So what are they going to buy? Well, on the resale end, they have a smaller inventory from which to choose. On the new home end, they have a smaller inventory from right. which to choose. So that kind of freezes up the market. Yeah. So when you have this frozen market, as far as the homes are concerned, that's when you're probably going to see more buyers chasing fewer homes, supply and demand. You know the story. Okay. Uh, one of the interesting numbers is she indicated that building permits and housing starts declined by 22.4% and 16.4% res respectively. What's interesting is that building permits is the bigger number. That's more of a leading indicator. It is. You, get the, you have to get the permit far before the start. Mm -hmm. So what this says is we're going into this. And the way these tend to work is they don't tend to start the process until they definitely can see demand building. Right. So my issue with builders is um, th th there's such a, a long lag time right. that... They keep looking for the numbers, but the numbers are so are so inaccurate. The longer out you go for for that perspective, right? That they're just they just seem to forever be playing catch up, one yeah. one way or another. Yeah, but remember they're stuck in between a rock and a hard place because they borrow the money to build the house, and they're carrying this cost. They have to be able to turn it quickly, mm -hmm. and they don't want to take the risk, so they wait until they feel like it's a right market. They come in and build a bunch of homes as fast as they can, try to get them on the market as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and sell them and turn them and take that cash to pay off the loan so that the, by the time that hopefully before the housing cycle changes, they're not out of money because that's what happened in the last one is they were borrowing money like crazy and building like crazy and they overbuilt for so long and they didn't stop after it was too late. And they're all stuck with all these subdivisions and land that they bought. Actually, most of the builders in 2008 that went out of business, uh, or they got crushed. It was it was it wasn't the houses, it was the land. Right. It was the land that they had bought. They had bought you know land, especially here in Vegas, was eight hundred thousand a residential acre. So if you bought you know a forty acre parcel just to build one subdivision, mm -hmm. you know you get thirty two million or so. You're you know and now and now what? You get thirty two million. You borrowed it to buy a piece of dirt, and now nobody's building on it, and you've you. You go thirty-two million, and you can't get you can't sell the land and get the money back. It's just gone. Right. So you're basically done. Yeah. Like you just that's it's like the riskiest thing you can imagine. Right. You know the other thing, depending on where you are, you know there are issues with the land too. Like here in Las Vegas, we, we do we are somewhat landlocked because the, mm -hmm. all the land around us is owned by uh, the Bureau of Land Management, and they infrequently uh, sell land, uh, and there doesn't seem to be a a pattern as to when they will bring land to, to market. So builders are in this mode of not knowing when they can get more land to build. Okay. Um, so the biggest factors here, now remember these are their opinions. That's We're just pointing out economically why what they're seeing that caused them to believe this. Mm -hmm. Inflation is good. Uh, real estate's a good hedge against inflation. Mm -hmm. That's one. Um, they don't have alternate investments. That's two. Mm -hmm. So real, the money, cash has to go somewhere. Uh, there are some deals out there right now mm -hmm. in real estate. We said back in June or July that we felt that October, November, December, January would be the four, four best months to probably potentially grab something. Cheaper, certainly cheaper than May. Mm -hmm. Of course, 2009 was probably a much better year to go buy something. Mm -hmm. We dealt with this in 2012, 
on the video, on the blog, where people said the market was going to crash again because of the shadow inventory. And a lot of people admitted that they had sold the house in 2012 because they had made, you know, 50, 60,000 and they thought that there was going to be a second wave of REO. Mm -hmm. And then they end up, they never, some of them never got back in because home prices just kept going up. And then inventory. Inventory is the big one. This is the one. Now, in Las Vegas alone, we've seen inventory just in the city of Las Vegas. 5,700 in late October. Mm -hmm. It was 5,700 homes on the market. We're at 4,300. Mm -hmm. It's dropped. Subst inventory has dropped substantially. If you say that's the holidays, which it could be, mm -hmm. then let's do this. Let's see what it is in February because there's no holidays in February. And if it's less than now, you have to ask yourself a question. Where are all the houses? Right. Like where are all the potential houses for people to buy? So, um, you know, I agree with you. I think, you know, the, the inventory will keep going down for the next couple of weeks okay. uh, because we're dealing with a couple of things. We're dealing with end of the year. So um, people are still trying to close deals before the end of the year. I know we, we don't have much time left. Yeah. Uh, but they are trying to close deals before the end of the year to take advantage of whatever their tax situation is. So you've got all of that happening. Of course, in December, we don't have very many homes coming on the market because of the holidays. So you're, you're kind of dealing with that as far as the diminished inventory. Uh, January kind of tends to be a pretty mellow month. Okay. Um, it just it, we're, we're recovering from the holidays. Uh, people are getting their homes ready to come on the market. Not a lot of homes come on the market. Come February, that's when homes t start to come on the market. March, you know, they, they tend to go gangbusters and, and, but, and, and April too. But the buyers are there too. The buyers are there too. And, uh, you know, buyers, again, they're trying to close deals now. But then come January, uh, I think they're going to be looking around a little more going, well, we'll just wait to see what, what else comes on the market. Okay. All right. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please subscribe, hit the notification bell. Leave us a comment. Tell us what market you're in, what you're seeing in your market, and um, what else. And um, let us know what interests you. Uh, we might do a video on what interests you. We appreciate you watching. Please subscribe, notification bell, like the video, share the video, and we'll see you on the next video. Bye. Bye.